Good morning and welcome to the Wilson Center. My name is Robert Daly. I'm the director of the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States here at the Wilson Center. And we're very happy to be joined today by Clyde Prestowitz, founder and president of the Economic Strategy Institute. Uh, Mr. Prestowitz, as many of you know, uh, is a labor economist who has worked on trade issues in Asia and around the world for 50 years. He negotiated with China in the early days, beginning in 1982, and also has decades of experience negotiating with Japan, uh, experience that led to his best-selling book, Trading Places, How We Are Giving Our Future to Japan and How to Reclaim It, uh, published in 1990. He has also served as vice chairman of the President's Committee on Trade and Investment in the Pacific, and he sits on the Intel Policy Advisory Board and the Advisory Board of the Export-Import Bank. We are here today to talk about his new book, See right here, the world turned upside down, America, China, and the struggle for global leadership, which is just out from Yale University Press and which is purchasable by all of you on amazon.com. Uh, like many economists, many experts in various fields around the world, Clyde Prestowitz has been thinking about China, the impacts of its rise on the United States and the global implications of Chinese power. And he doesn't like what he sees. In part one of the book, he concludes that, quote, China does not intend to find a niche for itself in the so-called liberal global order. Rather, it is bent on setting its own course to great power status. He goes on to describe that ambition of China's as a clear threat globally uh, and to the United States. And he's quite clear about the reasons why. He says, quote, a world dominated by China would be authoritarian, without rule of law, and would pursue state-guided economic policies. It would aim at complete surveillance of individuals at virtually all times, and would reject freedom of speech and a free press. He then goes on uh, in the final part of the book to offer a detailed and ambitious set of policy prescriptions for meeting the challenge from China and for preserving open democratic law-based systems, both here at home and also worldwide. Uh, one of, to me, the, the, the most striking features of the book uh, is that Clyde is refreshingly frank uh, about America's own economic rise and how to understand it uh, in context of our concerns about China. Uh, your chapter, How America Got Rich, uh, was, I think, extremely helpful uh, for, for me, Clyde, and I'm sure it will be for, for other readers as well. And he, he's very frank about the fact that it was mercantilist, protectionist policies in the United States, something close to an industrial policy, which included theft of intellectual property uh, and a manufacturing export-based policy that helped make the United States rich and indeed has made every country that got rich rich. So China is not following uh, its own path. It's following a, a well-trodden path. Um, nevertheless, he, he concludes, as I've said, that that path now spells trouble for the United States and much of the rest of the world. Clyde, uh, welcome to the Wilson Center. Very glad to hear from you this morning. Uh, what I've asked uh, Clyde Prestowitz to do is to take about 15 minutes or so introducing uh, his book, the ideas in his book. He and I will then have a dialogue, and then we'd like to open it up to your questions and comments, which you can send at any time during the discussion to china at wilsoncenter.org. I'll remind you of this, but it's china at wilsoncenter.org if you would like to ask Clyde Prestowitz a question. Again, thank you for joining us. Clyde, please tell us about the book. Oh, thank you very much, Robert. Um, you know, sometimes uh, when a new play or a new musical is, uh, is presented, you don't, go, you don't take it to Broadway first. Uh, you go to Philly or you go to Boston. So actually the China story, China-US story uh, is not um, a, a, a new phenomenon. Uh, we've been here before. Uh, and we've been here before in the 1970s and the 1980s with Japan. And I, I knew that very well because I went to school in Japan. I was the chief US negotiator with Japan. I lived and worked in Japan for many years. Um, and what I saw was a Japan uh, that was attempting to uh, become an advanced uh, uh, high-tech economy. And it was pursuing industrial policy. Uh, and uh, 
we had this situation in which uh, American companies had difficulty getting into the Japanese market, uh, and they would complain that Japan was being unfair. And we negotiators would go to Japan and we would say, hey, please, you guys stop being unfair. And they would say, what are you talking about? Uh, the problem is your businessmen don't try hard enough. Uh, they put the steering wheel on the wrong side of the car. Their delivery is always late. Their quality, come on. Uh, and, and it was kind of a Mexican standoff. Long story short, what I came to realize was that although Japan's a democracy and a market economy, it was not a democracy or a market economy like the US. Uh, and it pursued industrial policy, it protected certain markets, it uh, subsidized key industries, it stole technology. Uh, and, and I wrote a book about that, uh, as you mentioned, Trading Places, 1988, 1990. Well, that was, that was Philly. Now we're on Broadway with China. Uh, and it's a much bigger uh, country, much bigger economy, uh, and not at all uh, democratic. Uh, and very determined to become a world leader. Uh, and we have had problems very similar or reactions very similar to those that we had with Japan. But I think that there are two elements that, uh, that change the, the Chinese story a bit that are pretty crucial. First of all, <clears throat> it's important to understand that the Chinese Communist Party runs everything in China. Uh, it permeates China. It's not just that it runs the government, but about 35% of the Chinese economy is accounted for by state-owned enterprises. Uh, and even, and the Chinese Communist Party names the heads of all those state-owned enterprises. <clears throat> and and in, in so-called private enterprises, the Chinese Communist Party has party cells in all the private enterprises uh, and has a kind of power over Chinese companies that Washington could only dream of. So it's, it's a very powerful uh, force. The second point is this. The Chinese Communist Party has told us two important things. In document nine of the Chinese Communist Party Congress of uh, 2000 and, and uh, I think it was 2008, uh, it mentioned in a document on the, what they called the situation in the ideological sphere, it said that the Chinese Communist Party is against Western constitutional democracy. It's against the concept of universal values. <clears throat> it's against any uh, journalism that is not disciplined by the, by the party. Uh, so we know what the party values are. We know what it wants. It tells us exactly what it wants. It wants to be a, an authoritarian uh, dominating uh, party. Secondly, the party told us in its five-year plan of 2015 exactly where it wants to go. Uh, it, had a, uh, it had a program which it calls Made in China 2025. Uh, and it identified all the industries that China hopes to dominate by the year 2025. And what are those industries? Airplanes, semiconductors, robotics, artificial technology, biotech, and so forth. It's something about 15 major high-tech industries. So effectively, <clears throat> the party has told us that China is going to do whatever it needs to do to dominate those industries. And once it dominates those industries, it's going to uh, approach the world with a disdain for free speech and with a dislike for constitutional democracy uh, and a rule of law. Uh, and I think that in order to understand the implications of that globally, we actually have a, a kind of a laboratory uh, uh, experiment going on right now. Uh, <clears throat> Australia is uh, a major supplier to, to China. Uh, China is Australia's uh, largest export uh, partner. Uh, China, uh, Australia ex exports to China uh, iron ore, <clears throat> coal, uh, tourism, Australia's, most of Australia's tourists are Chinese. Uh, 
and education. A large number of students in Australia are from China. Uh, and it also exports things like barley and beef and wine and so forth. Now, <clears throat> since, since the early, since about 2005, or even earlier, uh, the Chinese uh, Communist Party has had a policy of trying to drive a wedge between the US and Australia. We know this because the uh, first secretary of the Chinese embassy in Canberra defected and brought the plan with him, which outlined the Chinese strategy and the steps China would take to drive a wedge between the US and China. And so there have been a number of a huge investment by Chinese state-owned corporations in Australia, a uh, huge uh, growth of uh, academic exchanges between China and Australia, and increasing interference in the, China, in the Australian political system by China. Now, <clears throat> in the wake of the COVID-19 crisis, uh, Australia's prime minister called publicly for an international investigation of the origins of COVID. Uh, China didn't like that. And suddenly it turned out that lobsters being exported from Australia to, to Shanghai were being left to die on the docks. Uh, and then it turned out that uh, barley from uh, Australia, which had been being exported to, to China for years, uh, suddenly there were no orders for barley. Uh, and then coal, no orders for coal. And then wine, uh, no, it was a, the Chinese imposed a huge, what they called a, a dumping tariff uh, on wine imports into China. Now, what's obviously going on is that China is using its uh, economic power <clears throat> to try to discipline Australia. In fact, China has issued a 14 point letter to the Aussies telling the Aussies to uh, consider carefully these 14 points uh, and to come into conformance with whatever the 14 points are in order to reestablish acceptable relationships. So that on a small scale is what I fear the world we, we may be going to on a larger scale uh, with China. Now, <clears throat> a mistake that, well, let, me, let me back up. It's important to understand why we're in China uh, in a very, why the United States and China are very tightly linked. Uh, and it's, it, there are two factors. <clears throat> One is that in the wake of the uh, fall of the Soviet Union, uh, American leaders declared that not only was the Cold War over, but uh, there was a famous book called The End of History, which declared that uh, democracy was the wave of the future uh, the Cold War, not only between the US and Russia, but between the US and China was over. Uh, <clears throat> and there was a view <clears throat> that by uh, bringing China into the global institutions, the World Bank, the IMF, and the World Trade Organization, China would become what some people called a responsible stakeholder in the rules-based liberal global order. Uh, and the argument was that the more we interacted economically and established close economic ties, uh, this would not only marketize China, but it would also liberalize China politically. Uh, that was the, the philosophical uh, underpinning, but the even stronger underpinning was the, uh, the fever that gripped American industry to get to China. Uh, and and uh, to be there at the beginning of what was seen as this huge uh, economic uh, uh, growth machine, which it is, uh, and make money. Uh, and so um, major U.S. CEOs formed the U.S. China Business Council. Uh, they made huge investments in China, which China subsidized. Uh, and so the it, you know if I look at at a company like Apple. Everything it makes is made in China. Uh, if, if, if China were to fall into a hole, a hole open in the ground and China fell in, there wouldn't be any Apple because Apple doesn't make anything except in China. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's very important to understand this very strong business uh, uh, tie of the US to China. Now, <clears throat> in dealing with that, um, 
I, I think it's important to understand that we have over the past, let's say 30 years, uh, the United States and other countries, but particularly the United States, we have had endless discussions uh, in various fora with China, but at a very high level. Uh, and all these meetings have been aimed at trying to persuade China to uh, operate according to the rules of the World Trade Organization, uh, to become more open, uh, to open more markets to foreign uh, entry, to open China to more foreign investment. In, in other words, to make China more like us. Uh, and along the way in those discussions, uh, we have begged China to become more like us. We have threatened China that if you don't do X, Y, Z, we might have to take uh, some uh, uh, harsher steps. Uh, but the premise has been that somehow, either by being nice or by threatening retaliation, we can change China's policies and China's behavior. That is wrong. We cannot, and we shouldn't even try, in my view. Uh, and then the second aspect of this has been that China is pursuing, as you mentioned, a well-trodden path. Uh, Germany, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, all became rich in the post-World War II era by pursuing what's known as industrial policy. The state and industry work together. The state subsidizes and protects industry until it become world competitive. Uh, and, uh, and every country that has done that, and as you pointed out, the US did that in its own past, has become rich. Uh, but our economists, have constantly argued that industrial policy is a bad thing and that uh, it uh, results in uh, less than, than high economic performance and that it's, uh, it's too much government in business. Government picking winners and losers is terrible. And so our, our economic establishment has argued against taking measures that would enable uh, a response, an effective response to the Chinese and other industrial policies. So to conclude, I would say that we need to examine ourselves, both in terms of rethinking industrial policy and, and admitting uh, to ourselves that all the talks with China are pretty useless. We're not going to change them. So let me conclude there. Hey, well, uh, thank you, Clyde. A, a couple of questions. Uh, first, in the book, you come pretty close to calling for complete trade, financial, and technical decoupling from China. Uh, you, you don't quite say that, but you say you point out, for example, you say that the more one invests and produces in China, the more one feeds the CCP, Chinese Communist Party dominated machine. Uh, says that any uh, ac American economic activity in China that strengthens China economically strengthens the CCP, ultimately to the detriment of the United States and to more liberal global systems. Uh, you write that the only Chinese investment allowed in the US should be in US government bonds. So you have no Chinese investment uh, and you don't want to see uh, American uh, retirement trust funds, for example, uh, these large things like mm -hmm. California personnel systems uh, investing in uh, Chinese equities or Chinese bonds. Uh, and this, you advocate this just as the Chinese equities and bond market is both more open to and more attractive to foreign investors like Ray Dalio, who, who, who's advocated for this. You know, the Chinese 10-year uh, sovereign debt instruments earn over 3% interest, whereas the United States, it's, it's under one. And so, and so money is going to go uh, to those instruments. So you acknowledge um, clearly, and you spend a lot of time on this, that decoupling from China will be difficult and that it will be costly. Uh, you write that previous generations of Americans took huge casualties and paid huge costs to meet challenges to our security and to our system. So my question is, uh, do we know how costly this is? Have you seen any good estimates of the real full costs to corporations, to consumers, obviously to labor, to the working class of decoupling? Has anybody attempted to put uh, a price tag on it? What is the you lay out the scope of the challenge. How much sacrifice over how much time are, are, are we calling for here? 
Well, <clears throat> I think there, there have been attempts <clears throat> to do that. I saw, in fact, uh, uh, some estimates uh, in a newspaper article yesterday. But the truth is that um, nobody has really uh, done a thorough uh, uh, analysis of that. And, and I think it's kind of impossible to do because <clears throat> a lot of the costs are speculative and some of the costs or benefits um, are, are non-financial. Uh, and so I, let me try to put it in a in, in kind of a concrete comparison. So uh, in the last uh, several months and weeks, um, there has been talk of genocide in Xinjiang province in China, the Chinese oppressing the Uyghurs, trying to turn the Uyghurs into Han Chinese. And we've condemned that. Uh, and we have, uh, we, we the US have uh, banned imports of any products like cotton that are uh, grown or made in Xinjiang. Uh, so why do we do that? <clears throat> well, we do that because we place a high value on, on human freedom, individual freedom. Now, I have never seen an estimate of that value. I've never seen, you know, somebody say, well, human freedom is worth uh, uh, $50 trillion. Uh, and, and you're never going to see that estimate because it's an impossible estimate to make. And yet we say it's very, very valuable. And we say that it's something that we should defend even to the extent of not importing anything from Xinjiang, China. And I mean, honestly, what the Chinese do in Xinjiang doesn't really affect us directly. And yet we, take a, we make a big noise about it and we take action not to import from Xinjiang. But <clears throat> while we're doing that, uh, Ray Dalio, you mentioned him, a uh, big hedge fund manager in the U.S., has been in, in Beijing uh, meeting with top officials. He wrote an editorial in uh, one of the leading U.S. newspapers talking about how China is the future, the U.S. is the past, um, and uh, urging his investors to move their money to China. Um, we have Tim Cook, who on the one hand has said that nothing that Apple does it comes from Xinjiang, but on the other hand, every iPhone that is made by Apple in China is contributing <laughs> to the growth and the strength of the Chinese economy. And it's that growth and strength that enables the Chinese to oppress the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. So if you're serious about freedom and human rights, it's kind of contradictory to be throwing your money into the machine that is oppressing and carrying out the uh, attack on human rights. Now, that's, you know, Xinjiang is a small uh, uh, part of China, a few million people. Uh, I've just mentioned Australia. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting. I, I had this discussion, actually. I, went, I was in Australia in the uh, in 2019, interviewing a lot of Australians, and I met with the head of one of the major uh, banks in Australia, and he made an interesting comment to me. He said, Clyde, he said, you know, we were with the Brits in World War I, we were with you guys, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Afghanistan, but he said, if there's any dust up over Taiwan, don't look for us on the beach. I said, well, why not? Well, he said, look, you know, our biggest export is iron ore, it goes to China. Second is coal, it goes to China. Third is education, students are all Chinese. Fourth is tourism, the tourists are all Chinese. So, you know, we need to be careful. But uh, there are other people in Australia who think freedom of speech is worth something. Uh, and, and they began to find Chinese money finding its way into Australian politics. They began to find that all of the Chinese language newspapers in Australia had been bought by the Chinese Communist Party and were essentially publishing the party line in Australia. Uh, those people placed a high value on freedom of speech and independence and human rights and rule of law. And so they have resisted and China is punishing them by re arbitrarily reducing its imports. So uh, we see, you know, that's, that's the future, uh, in my view, of uh, not just Australia, but the EU and ultimately the US, if we go down a road in which China becomes the dominant technology economic leader. So 
how do you make that case internationally? Because even if we were, say, able to decouple from China in these various ways, and there are a lot of questions about whether that's practical right. at all. Right. And even if we were, say, willing to hypothetically pay the costs for the reasons that you described, uh, earlier this week, I heard one of our leading analysts of US-China economic relations say that closing down the United States relationships with China, trade, technological, yeah. is really just like shutting down one lane of a nine lane highway. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because all the other countries are still doing this. And the result of that is then that we uh, end up isolating ourselves from a lot of our allies, but also from sources of wealth that, and you know, sources of say lower cost goods for Americans. Uh, sources of a 4% uh, return on investment for American public employees uh, who, who want that 4%. So going beyond US-China, what does this mean internationally? Do you want to close down every lane on that nine lane highway or you just want to redesign the highway? What are we talking about? <laughs> well, uh, I think it's, uh, on the one hand, I think the argument uh, of cost is overstated. <clears throat> um, let me make two points. One is that, um, all, all uh, free countries face the same conundrum. Australia is facing it. Vietnam is, is not actually free world, but it's interesting that Vietnam does not get its, does not allow Huawei into Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam doesn't have any truck with Chinese uh, investment in Vietnam. Uh, the uh, European countries, uh, it's a spectrum. The, the Germans uh, think that they're doing well in China, so they tend to be uh, wanting to cooperate more with China. Um, other Europeans are less enamored. Uh, Japan and, and uh, uh, South Korea uh, have their own concerns uh, about China. Uh, so I think that uh, this is a debate that uh, many free world countries are going to have to experience. Uh, <clears throat> and I think that uh, <clears throat> many countries, when they face the reality that I've just kind of spelled out, will indeed prefer to form tighter relations between the free, tighter economic bonds between the free world countries. Uh, and more limitation on China. But I think the second point is that <clears throat> when we talk about the cost of decoupling from China, let, let's, let's remember something. <clears throat> it's not we who are decoupling, <clears throat> it's China who is decoupling. Um, go all the way back to 1993, uh, when uh, China was not even in the WTO and China's economy was tiny. But in 1993, China determined to build its own GPS satellite system. It could have used the Galileo system of the EU. It could have used the GPS US system, but no, 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 it was gonna have a Chinese system, which just went into operation a few months ago. 1997, while we were negotiating to bring China into the World Trade Organization, China built the Great Firewall to cut its internet off from the World Wide Web. Now, at the time, uh, this was mentioned to President uh, uh, Clinton, uh, and Clinton laughed. He said, ha, 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 the Chinese are going to try to control the internet. Ha, 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 it'll be like trying to join nail jelly to the wall. Never happened. Well, Clinton was wrong. Uh, so China decoupled. Uh, it doesn't allow Google in, in China, you know, go to, go to uh, used to be you could go to Hong Kong and get Google, but the minute you stepped over the border, you couldn't get Google. Now I'm not even sure you can get it in Hong Kong. Uh, it doesn't allow Facebook, it doesn't allow Amazon. So China has for a long time been decoupling and China has been aiming for a long, I mean, made in China 2025, what's that tell you? It tells you they don't want to, they want to make their own semiconductor chips. Right now they can't, but when they can, they're not going to buy from us. So I think we have to understand that decoupling is going to happen. It's just whether it's going to happen on their terms or our terms. Uh, an important paper has been released recently under uh, a committee headed by Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google. Uh, and in that paper, he, he acknowledges 
what I'm saying, that it, it's just going to be extremely increasingly difficult uh, to maintain a uh, so-called uh, uh, combined global economy when you have a major player who's aiming at, uh, at self-sufficiency and not just self-sufficiency, but at dominance by dint of setting the standards and the rules for the system. Uh, now, second point is this. <clears throat> uh, for many, many years, economists have been arguing that free trade is always and everywhere a win-win proposition. Uh, and they have acknowledged that there are some costs in, in involved in free trade in that, sure, uh, <clears throat> if um, Japanese autos flood the American market, some auto workers will lose their jobs. But the argument is that the benefit to consumers is so great uh, that it outweighs uh, the loss of a few auto jobs. And anyhow, the auto workers can get jobs doing other things. So the argument is that the, there will be some losers in a, <clears throat> excuse me, in, a free, <clears throat> in a free trade world, but the winners are far outweigh the losers and the winners will compensate the losers. Now, that argument has begun come thinner and thinner. And in fact, uh, David Autor, a uh, professor at MIT, has published a paper which uh, demonstrates pretty much that that's a very weak argument, at least in some cases. Uh, and, and here's why. First of all, it's not just one industry. If you have displacement in one industry, sure, maybe workers can find other jobs. But when you lose your industrial base, you have a lot of workers and not just workers, but families looking for uh, some alternative. And you know, the argument is, well, you, you live in Georgia, you lose your job in Georgia, you go to California. Oh, well, maybe you can. Maybe you have a mother and father in a nursing home where you have kids in school. And there are a million reasons why it's difficult to kind of jump around from place to place. Secondly, what has never been quantified is when you lose an industry, you lose the skills tied up in that industry. That's never really been quantified, but it can be pretty enormous. Third point is this. When we went through this offshoring uh, rage in the 1990s and between 2000 and 2010, the argument was that the wages in China are so cheap that consumers will get great uh, value in the US. Well, wages in China are not that cheap anymore. And in any case, <clears throat> manufacturing has become highly uh, um, industrialized and, and highly automated. Uh, so actually, um, again, back to Schmidt's group, they have looked at uh, how would you rebuild in the U.S. and how would you uh, reindustrialize the U.S. And the feeling is that by use of new technology, by robotics, by 3D printing, uh, that a lot of production can be done domestically in the United States in high-tech industries uh, at reasonable costs, paying decent wages uh, to employees. Think about the semiconductor industry. The semiconductor industry is highly uh, automated. Uh, workers make very high wages uh, and it's co very competitive to make semiconductors in the United States. So the argument is that we can do a lot more than most economists uh, are, are willing to admit. <clears throat> but of course, as you acknowledge in the book, because of the degree of automation, there aren't going to be very many high paid uh, workers uh, who, are, who are making semiconductors in the United States. So I'd, I'd like to come to some of your recommendations. One of the, I think, the great virtues of the book is that you acknowledge that this is going to be hard, and it really involves a fundamental rethink of the, the doctrines of free trade, but also of uh, very you know, deeply held domestic beliefs. You point out, for example, uh, that unless there is a more equitable, uh, equitable distribution of wealth, we can't get where you want us to go. Right. And the fact that CEOs make whatever it now is up to 700 times what a factory floor worker makes, you can't put that one on China. That one's on us, right? That's not globalization. That's domestic right. policy. Right. And so you propose uh, a whole slate of possible approaches to this, which are, are coordinated. And I think you're uh, saying that this all needs to be done. Right. We can't go through all of those now. But you're, you're obviously also aware of what a heavy political lift 
a, a truly epical change those would be. So coming to the Biden administration, if you could only get you know, one or two of your structural reforms over the finish line and really do it, what would you prioritize? And again, I know we, we can't do a survey of everything. I recommend you know, reading the book for that. But what, what are items number one mm -hmm. or two? Well, I'm glad you recommend reading the book. It's uh, and th that's the best thing. But uh, I, I think that on the one hand, I think that we we not, we the United States need to um, go back to the kind of industrial policies that we had um, during World War II and during the Cold War. Um, you remember this, the the Russians sent up Sputnik, and we replied by going to the moon. Um, um, we created the internet. Uh, people think that the internet was created by Steve Jobs or, uh, or, or Microsoft, but it wasn't. It was created by the US government. Um, so I think we need a far reaching industrial policy, essentially imitate China. Look at China's made in China 2025. That's what we should be doing, made in America 2025 uh, on the one hand. On the second hand, I think that um, Inequality uh, in the U.S. economy is is way out of out of line. I mean, it's interesting um, if you look at a per capita GDP uh, and compare the U.S. to all other countries. You know, with the exception of a few small places like Luxembourg or Liechtenstein or Singapore, the U.S. has the highest GDP per capita. But if you cut out of that comparison the top three or 4% of, of, of earners in each economy, suddenly the US falls way down. Our GDP per capita for middle-class people and for uh, people in the lower uh, wage earning classes, we're, we're terrible. And we look like Mexico uh, or Brazil. Uh, and I think that uh, we need to rethink our whole uh, social uh, uh, tax and social welfare scheme, uh, and we're going to have to increase taxes. Uh, the we have we have a huge imbalance of a few very wealthy people making a lot of money, and we have a large number of people who are just living paycheck to paycheck. And with COVID, uh, you know, they're not even getting a paycheck. Uh, and I think that we need to. You know, Ronald Reagan always complained uh, when he was running for office, he complained that he, he, his taxes were so high that he only worked two or three months a year for himself and the rest of the year he was working for the government. And that was true, but you know what? Ronald Reagan had a pretty nice lifestyle uh, even though he was working for the government 10, 10 months a year. Uh, and I think we need to go back to the kind of tax structure that we had in the 1960s and, and early 1970s. Um, I like, you know, Bernie, Bernie Sanders had a good idea, $15 an hour minimum wage. Uh, Andrew Yang, I liked his idea, gave everybody a thousand bucks a month or whatever. Um, I'm not being, I'm not trying to be trivial or funny. I mean, I think that this is, a, if you look at a country like Sweden or Finland or, or Singapore or Japan, uh, it's a much more even, uh, balance. Uh, and we need to get to that kind of balance or, and this is where you get to this question of cost, uh, Bob. Um, what's the cost to the United States of that invasion of the capital? Huge, right? Huge. Okay. That invasion had many causes, but one of the causes was offshoring and globalization. A lot of people got displaced and they have not been able to recover their, their uh, earning capacity and not been able to recover the kind of uh, life that they had before, and they're very unhappy, and it has huge political ramifications. So, you know, is the cost of bringing Apple back to the United States to make a few things in the U.S. higher than the cost of invading the capital? I don't think so. <laughs> and of course, this is where the complexity of our domestic politics comes into play, because my guess is that most of those people who invaded the capital are not going to support higher taxes for the wealthy and the corporations, right? So you're going to have a, a, a difficult Well, there is George Soros. George has uh, <laughs> been proposing that. <laughs> Let, let's go to some uh, questions from our audience today. And again, if you would like to ask Clyde Prestowitz a question, please send an email to china at wilsoncenter.org, wilsoncenter, one word, dot org. This is from Bob Kuttner of the American Prospect. 
He asks, for the US to embrace a serious industrial policy, which rules and norms of the current trading system, which China honors in the breach, would we need to alter or abolish? What rules and norms should substitute? Well, I think that um, the, the rules of the trading system at the moment are ridiculous. Um, the, the, on the one hand, we have, we have rules that argue that uh, if, if your opponent, uh, if your trading partner is re restricting access to his market, nevertheless, you need to keep your market open according to the commitments you made in the WTO. So China is selectively restricting access to its markets. We're not restricting any access to our markets. Well, we ought to throw that overboard. Uh, if China is going to protect its solar industry, we ought to be doing the same thing. Uh, uh, so I, I feel that you know a much more uh, reciprocal uh, 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 treatment standard is is a more fair and frankly easier to understand kind of system. Um, second thing is that um, government procurement. Uh, Biden has just announced uh, Buy America. Biden is right. Uh, the US government ought to be buying uh, American-made products. Uh, it, it takes taxpayer money and uh, with that money, it could create a few taxpayer jobs. Um, and particularly when we're dealing with mercantilist countries like China, uh, or I mean, there are other mercantilist countries like Germany. Um, when we're dealing with those kinds of companies, countries who are effectively subsidized in their industries, and then we say, oh yeah, come on over here and buy uh, and, and sell to our government as well. Uh, it creates imbalances that are, are uh, harmful uh, and difficult to reserve. So I think uh, essentially, I think tit for tat uh, is practically the way to go. Okay, uh, we have a question now from uh, David Moschella who asks, what specifically should the US government do regarding Apple's dependency on China? Which I guess in the context of your argument, you know, how do you force them to pull out um, and then, the, and this has, uh, this is now me speaking, uh, not David, uh, but there's always been Apple's iPhones have been sort of the poster child for the nature of the global supply chain. That China's right. mostly doing final assembly of complex components that are manufactured elsewhere, including in the United States and by our very close allies. Mm -hmm. And in fact, even for a Chinese made, made in China iPhone, because most of the profit is in design and marketing, most of that profit still goes into American pockets. Yeah. So how specifically do we change this? Right. Well, let me just correct you a little bit. Uh, when Apple first went to China and was uh, began producing iPhones in China, you're correct. Uh, it was essentially assembly and the, the actual Chinese value added was quite small. It was like four or 5% of the value of the product. That has changed. Uh, much more of the production of components has moved to China. I don't have the exact numbers, but I'm thinking it's about a third of the value of the, of the phone is now actually made in China. But look, here's a, here's a uh, let me give you, in the 1980s, I was sitting in my, I was then uh, uh, counselor to the Secretary of Commerce in the Reagan administration, I'm sitting in my office and my assistant came in and she said, uh, Clyde, Steve Jobs is on the phone. And I laughed, I said, ah, oh, come on, stop putting me on. No, 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 it's Steve Jobs. Okay, so I pick up the phone and it's Steve Jobs. <clears throat> and at that time, uh, Apple was introducing its first uh, uh, laptop computers and they were having a hard time selling in Japan. And, and Steve wanted some help from the US government to open the Japanese market. So I flew out to Cupertino and I met with Apple people and we put together a program and we were able to make some progress in getting Apple laptop, laptops into the uh, Chinese Japanese market. Steve didn't complain. Um, nobody at Apple complained. Nobody at the Business Roundtable complained about the American government uh, getting involved in business and helping uh, American companies. Uh, now, today um, we have this crazy situation. So you've been watching the developments in Hong Kong uh, and uh, 
about a year ago when the Hong Kong young people were demonstrating, uh, there was an app, there was a, an app in, in the Apple App Store that the Hong Kong kids were using to track the police in Hong Kong. So the kids would know where the police were and they wouldn't go there. Beijing leaned on Tim Cook and told him that they would like him to get that app out of the App Store. And he took it out. Um, recently, Tim has made some statements about Xinjiang and how Apple doesn't buy anything from Xinjiang. Well, okay, but uh, Apple's contributing enormously to uh, strengthen the Chinese economy. Uh, and Apple, everything that Apple sells, this is so important to understand, everything that Apple sells originated in a US government program. Semiconductors, telecommunications, all that stuff came out of US government financed uh, uh, DARPA uh, budgets. Uh, and so, uh, you know, for, and, and think about this, in Washington, a guy like Tim Cook or, or uh, Steve Jobs, or whoever, a, a big U.S. corporate CEO in Washington has a lot of clout. He has armies of lawyers and lobbyists. He has instant entree at the White House, at the Congress, or wherever. Uh, he's a big player in Washington. What kind of a player do you think he is in Beijing? He's on his knees. He's kowtowing. So these guys are more subject to pressure from China than they are from the US. When they go up and testify before Congress and they say they represent American business, baloney, they don't represent American business. They represent more Beijing than they do Washington. Uh, and so I don't have a lot of hesitation to say, hey, the national security of the United States, the value of freedom of speech and rule of law is so great that I'm prepared to uh, accept a few costs. Okay, thank you. The next question comes from Mike Nelson at the Carnegie Endowment uh, for International Peace. He writes, I look forward to reading your book. We first met in the late 80s when I was working for Senator Hollings and Senator Gore on tech policy and competitiveness. I'm glad you discussed the parallels between the US-Japan relationship in those days and the US-China tech tensions today. One thing you did not mention is the corruption and cronyism in both business and government in both countries. I notice your book's index shows that there are 10 pages that contain the word corruption. Does corruption hinder the CCP's efforts to achieve its ambitious goals? Will they continue to export corruption to other countries? Oh, excellent question. And I do remember our uh, earlier conversations. Thank you. Um, well, I think that uh, they do export corruption. Uh, I think that when you look at the Belt and Road program of China, uh, you look at the deals that are being made uh, between China and many other countries, it's, it's, uh, they're not being done on the basis of any rules that the World Bank would accept or that other free world development banks would accept. And so I do think that that's an important factor. Uh, and I think that in some ways <clears throat> it facilitates the extension of Chinese uh, influence uh, because they are able to go to countries that have weak governments or corrupt uh, governments and, and gain entree and gain influence in places that we would prevent our companies from going for precisely the reasons of corruption. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Uh, another question. Can you talk about China's increasingly successful efforts to dominate many of the international forums and the implications of that, such as the World Health Organization, uh, UN agencies, et cetera, China's move into the global leadership realm? Yes, that's a, a very important point. And I it comes back to something that, again, we have to understand clearly. Um, the Chinese government, Communist Party, uh, apparatus is really good uh, and, and, and persistent. They don't stop. And remember that they've been doing this now for a long time. They don't have changes of government and officials. I mean, they, I, I've forgotten exactly what it is, but the, let's say the average time that an assistant secretary of, of state or commerce or, or any U.S. government agency is actually in office, I think it's about two years. <clears throat> 
Well, in China, these guys are there. They've been there for their, their career. So they've been working at penetrating the UN and the WTO and all of the global organizations and the standard setting bodies. They've been working at this for the last 40, 50 years. They're good. They're highly educated. They speak English. They read our stuff. They know a lot more about us than we know about them. Uh, and um, we are going to have to get serious uh, about our own, uh, how we run our own bureaucracy and how we collect information uh, and how we make ac give access to information. Um, you know, we, we, we we're very open society. We, we don't really realize the extent of our own. You have to live in a close, more closed society to understand the extent of our openness. Uh, and I don't want to get rid of that. That's why I want to fight this. I, I want our openness, but we have to understand that the openness has, uh, has its own um, uh, vulnerabilities that we have to protect against. Hey, thanks. I'm, I've got another question for you now. I'm, I'm gonna warn you, this is a tricky one. Uh, and this is in some ways a Chinese question, but it's a question that's also asked uh, in many other parts of the world. You write in the book that China's effort to realize Xi Jinping's goals, the rejuvenation of the great Chinese nation, you write that these efforts, quote, would not be threatening if China operated under the rule of law with substantial freedom of speech and tolerance of religions, ethnic minorities, and varying philosophies. My question is, are you sure? Are you sure about that? How confident are you that America, Americans, American politicians would accept Chinese economic, military, and cultural preeminence? Wow. That we would accept Chinese global leadership if China were more or less democratic, right. more of a stakeholder. Do we really just settle easily into a status like the UK accepted vis-a-vis -vis the United States after World War II? Right. I ask because the Chinese are pretty sure that we wouldn't. They're pretty yeah. sure that we're yeah. hypocrites yeah. Yeah. and that when we talk about our principles, we're really talking about our power. Yeah. And because they believe that, yeah. that gives them a reason to not try to speak to the principles argument or to satisfy any of these requests because we'll just move the goalposts because we're really about our hegemony or preeminence yeah. no matter what we preach. So are you, as you write, really yeah. comfortable with a preeminent China, vast and wealthy, if it happens to be democratic? Um, I think so. <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, and you're right, the Chinese don't believe us at all. Um, there's some precedents that we can look at. Um, the UK was the great, the world's great power uh, in the uh, first half of the 20th century. Uh, and the UK, interestingly, around, uh, around the turn of the 19th century, it, the UK made an interesting calculation. Um, Germany was growing rapidly uh, and was uh, building up its uh, armed forces and trying to obtain uh, colonies around the world. The U.S. was also doing the same thing. And, um, and the Brits had, throughout the 19th century, had dominated, you know, Britannia ruled the waves, and not just the waves of the Atlantic, but uh, the waves, period, around the world, including the Caribbean. Uh, and the Brits were faced with a question in order to maintain their naval superiority over both Germany and the US, it, it was, wasn't gonna be feasible. They had to decide, were they gonna, they were gonna focus on maintaining superiority over the Germans or were they gonna to try to maintain superiority over both? And remember in the British interpretation of superiority, they had to have a fleet that was one and a half times as large as the next fleet. So, you know, to beat both the US and Germany, they had to have an, an enormous fleet, which was not feasible. So the Brits decided, okay, the, the Americans, we, they're a pain in the ass, but, uh, you know, we can accept that. So the Brits really gave us the Atlantic and they gave us the Caribbean and they focused on the Germans. Uh, and so, you know, I would not argue that there would be no friction between a uh, democratic, uh, free market, uh, capitalist China and the U.S. Uh, I mean, we have friction with Canada, so in, inevitably there would be friction. But I think uh, it would be a very livable situation if it weren't for the fundamental 
uh, uh, split on, on free speech rule of law. <clears throat> okay, one, one, one last question. Um, you write a lot in your retelling of the history of US-China relations between 1979 and roughly the advent of Xi. You write a lot about what, uh, what you call the delusions of the people who are advocating for engagement. Uh, and so I want to ask about what I'm afraid may, might be a new delusion, uh, even of the more uh, hawkish wing of, of Americans who, who think about US-China policy. And, and you say in your book, and you repeat this several times in, in, in different forms, say, quote, there is no contest between the Chinese people and those of the United States. The tug of war is between the United States and the CCP, Chinese Communist Party, party state that tightly controls its people. Again, are you, are you sure about that? And if so, how do you know? My own experience, you know, 30 years in China suggests that this new uh, division between the party and the people that former Secretary of State Pompeo and others really started to make a linchpin of their China policy. I'm not sure that that linchpin can bear much weight. Uh, it is not true that the Chinese Communist Party simply organically represents all of the true interests of the Chinese people in the way that it claims. We can reject all that as self-serving nonsense, uh, fine. But still, you know, time in China indica has indicated to me that while the Chinese, like everybody else, grouses about aspects of their government and some people are dip deeply dissatisfied, there is no hard division. And I worry that when American politicians say this, they're telling themselves that in fact, the Chinese people are really secretly on our side yeah. and therefore our task is easier than it might otherwise seem. Whereas I think that the task is very much harder. Yeah. What we deal with in China is very complex and it's a nation in which the Chinese people, like us, have the government they deserve, more or less, for better or for worse, uh, and are not secretly you know, on our side necessarily. They're often critical of their government, but they're pride of the, proud of the strides that they've made. So I worry about this as a new yeah. you know, emergent delusion that should not guide policy. And I want to give you a chance. We've got two minutes. This is going to have to be very yeah, okay. quick, but well, to respond so, to that. But, uh, very quickly, uh, I, I agree with you. It's a delusion for us to imagine that the Chinese people are secretly with us. Uh, it would be a huge mistake to proceed on that basis. But I want to introduce another element, which is really what lies behind my comment. Um, I told you I went to school in Japan. Uh, I speak mm -hmm. Japanese, and my, my youngest son is an adopted Japanese boy. In the negotiations of the trade wars of the 1980s, the term Japan basher became popular in the US. Uh, certain US columnists uh, loved to identify me as a Japan basher. Now think about that from a basher is not reasonable. A basher is uh, emotional, racially prejudiced. Uh, and, and if a guy's a basher, you don't need to listen to him because obviously, okay. So I want to make it very clear that when we're dealing with China, this is not about, you know, it's not about bashing the Chinese people. It's, it's not about racial or ethnic or, or uh, national differences. I want to make it very clear that the, 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 the source of all this tension is this division between the Communist Party says Western constitutional democracy is a no-no and speech undisciplined by the party is a no-no. And we over here say, no, it's a yes, yes. That's the fundamental uh, division. And I, I think it's important that we, our war is not with the Chinese people. Our war is with the Chinese Communist Party. Well, Clyde Prestowitz, thank you for bringing just a terrific conversation on a, a vital, vital issue, as you point out, to the Wilson Center and to our audience. Again, the book is the World Turned Upside Down, America, China, and the Struggle for Global Leadership. All of the issues you raised in the book and that we've discussed uh, today, Clyde, we are going to continue to discuss at the Kissinger Institute throughout the year. And this really provides a great foundation for that conversation. So thank you once again, and thanks to everybody for tuning in. Thank you, Ramon.